Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Summa Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Summa Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Summa Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sangang Namasami We have like two melodic chants in the whole of the Theravada, and that's one of them. So we, we get to savor it. I don't know if people notice the flower die right when we are chanting about death, but uh, <laughs> it was well played. It reminds me um, when Longport Cha uh, had just finished their new meditation hall, he went on a walk there with this disciple, and they noticed the cement was already cracking, and uh, the disciple was like, oh, what a shame, you know, it's already already breaking. And Ajahn Chah said, uh, no crack, no Buddhism. <laughs> so I thought that was quite good. But uh, today I wanted to talk about a more uh, perhaps uplifting but equally important topic as impermanence. And so often the teachings we gravitate towards in the West are high wisdom teachings on impermanence, not self, transcendent dhamma. And we forget that uh, in the Buddhist conception of the path, the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, you can divide it into the eight factors of right view, right intention, uh, so on through right mindfulness and right concentration. or you can divide it into three of sila, morality, uh, samadhi, uh, cultivation of wholesome states of unification of mind, and panya, wisdom. And wisdom is the seeing of the impermanent, not-self nature of the world. Uh, uh, we're surrounded by a vortex of change, and insofar as we tie our heart to it, uh, our heart will break. But the first two factors of morality and uh, concentration or unification of mind hold us through that vision. They're the brightening factors in the heart that mean that as the veil falls, as we see through it, we are able to intuit something profoundly bright and beyond the shifting world of conditions in the heart. And one of the most fundamental ways of brightening the heart, this one of the things that holds us through these harrowing visions of the transitory nature of what we grasp, is giving, dana. It's the first of the spiritual perfections, uh, the paramitas, and it was also in the uh, commentarial telling, the last of the spiritual perfections which the Buddha brought to culmination, which means it's both the beginning of the path and a thread that runs throughout it, giving. And it's so underemphasized in modern Western Dharma circles. They did a uh, study on what they called blue zones in the world, which are regions with the highest longevity. And the regions that had this blue zone quality um, had five factors in commons, common. Uh, people had a lot of stairs, moderate exercise, purpose, community, and beans. So we're ho hoping to provide you with at least two of those five with less emphasis on the beans, but purpose and community. This is something which we are trying to uh, bring here into Seattle, into this, into this uh, group. And so much of modern uh, existence in is a siloed, atomized experience. A recent study showed that the most, uh, the older generation is less lonely than the younger generation now of the sort of the under 30 crew. And this has wound its way into practice circles as well, where people go home, they have their practice, they sit, and you don't get a chance to touch one another in 
uh, in your hearts as, as is really necessary. Um, this opportunity for community and therefore for giving, for giving up the self, anatta in action, as Ajahn Kobilo says, is lacking. So this is what we're trying to create again as a fabric uh, based around the path, around the practice, around a transcendent goal. And it is not a small thing, and it is not trivial. The Buddha's teachings, we often read the Pali Canon, and so much of it's about finding seclusion, going off to the woods, um, and meditating alone. And there's certainly a place for that. But the Buddha was giving those teachings in the context of, of a society that was profoundly integrated. And, uh, you know, you go to Thailand and to villages in Ubon, and one child will, will be raised by five or six different families just with their houses right by one another. Everyone knows each other's arguments. It's all one big cohesive uh, whole. And our job in the West is to not so much pull back into ourselves, although there is time for retreat, but to rebuild the fabric we have lost. And if anyone has felt something special about this community, then you know that that's one of the really unique features which we are uh, finding together, is what it means to come uh, together with people you care for, who support you on the path. And the Buddha spoke about six principles of harmony, of cordiality, in a sutta called the Kosambiya Sutta, in the middle-length discourses. And it's an extremely inspiring sutta, given from extremely uninspiring circumstances, because the monks were arguing about, uh, basically one of them didn't flush the toilet, and it spiraled into this huge faction thing, and the Buddha admonished them, they didn't listen, so he left on retreat after giving the sutta, Eventually, they came around. I think the villagers stopped feeding them, uh, but <laughs> that works. But the suit is profound. And what it says is these are the six principles of cordiality that lead to amicability, to fellowship, to, to concord. One maintains loving kindness in bodily acts towards one's companions in the spiritual life, both in public and in private. One maintains loving kindness in one's verbal acts towards one's spiritual companions in both public and private. One maintains loving kindness in mental acts towards one's spiritual companions in the holy life. One, um, whatever one has gained, whatever righteous gains one has gotten, one does not partake of them without first having shared with their companions in the spiritual life. One dwells with morality, sila, in tune, in harmony with com one's companions in the spiritual life. And the sixth, and the Buddha says, this is the kingpin, the roof beam, the most important, the summit, is one has shared right view with one's companions in the spiritual life that is onward leading, penetrating, leading to the ending of suffering. So the first of these, uh, having, maintaining loving kindness in one's bodily acts. Uh, it's meaningful to see the emphasis in monasteries around receiving guests, hospitality. It's a value raised up in every society to such heights, and often I feel like it is somewhat forgotten in, in ours. Um, we have a very strict etiquette written into the monastic code about how we receive a guest, how we put out foot washing water for them, how we uh, attend to them, how we make sure they have everything they need. And similarly, this aspect of hospitality, uh, the Buddha really emphasized it. Uh, he said of the six objects of reverence that you should hold with great respect, it's the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, training, heedfulness, and then the sixth is receiving guests, hospitality. And it's great because the first five can really, you know, when I was at Mopjan, I was the, uh, my monastery where I ordained at, I was the guest monk. And you'd be getting along with your practice, and then a group of 30 unannounced uh, Malaysian retreatants would show up wanting uh, a week-long retreat, and the guest, the sort of 
administrative monk had forgotten to tell you about it, and that's your practice for the next week. And it was just suffering if all you're paying attention is the fir to is the first five. But this is the beauty, because you can really think, I need to get along with my practice, heedfulness, training, the triple gem. But then the Buddha puts in that sixth, hospitality, receiving guests, and that's the final flag, is you put all that sort of self-centered focus aside, and you give your whole heart to making someone feel welcome. And I constantly recollect and lean into that tension when it comes up, because what I found is that if I really made that my practice, making these people feel loved, cared for, accommodated, then it was a great week and my heart emerged with a lot of brightness from that. And the, uh, we had a monk who spent time at a Christian monastery and the monks there had a policy of whenever someone walked into their workshop, they had to treat them like Christ. And if their policy was that person had to have a cup of tea in their hand within three minutes or else they'd failed. We're in Seattle, so we can go for coffee, but that's your, that's your standard. Three minutes, cup of coffee, cup of tea. I want a community here where when someone asks, says they're coming to town, is there a hotel nearby? I want a community where five people come forward and say, just stay in my house, I have a room. And can we feel that tension between the space which is ours, our ordered life, and understanding that when you let that go, when you lean into it and just open the space, it can be inconvenient, it can be difficult, and yet this is exactly where life enters you and where we rebuild this fabric, and it's sacred. The Buddha designated certain things as sacred, as worthy of respect, because it helps counteract all these tendencies of self-centeredness and reclusiveness in us. The next, uh, oh, and to say it's not just hospitality, but caring for, for the sick. Uh, can we have a community where if someone gets ill, there's a pie on their doorstep? If they're in the hospital where someone's going to visit them, uh, there's a beautiful s story of uh, the Buddha walking with Venerable Ananda, his attendant, and they come across a sick monk lying in his own uh, vomit because he's so ill. And the other monks were just, you know, it, it was a lot to take care of this monk. And the Buddha and Venerable Ananda lift the monk and clean him off and tend to him. And the Buddha says, look, monks, anyone who cares for an ill uh, for one of you who is ill, it's the same as caring for me. We are a family here, and can we cultivate that ethic of radical giving? When uh, I was bowing up here a few weeks ago, uh, some of you might have noticed I had some holes in my socks, and I think like six people brought me socks or offered to bring me socks. I literally had at the end of, yes, last Saturday, I think, 20 pairs of socks, no, no, 20 socks, so 10 pairs home with me. So I have enough socks, um, but, but can, can you extend that to more than just the monk? Can you see someone else's whose socks are a little bit down and why not bring them some socks? Like what's wrong with that? It's beautiful. So the second uh, thing the Buddha says is to cultivate uh, acts of loving kindness, maintain acts of lo loving kindness in speech, towards one's companions in this spiritual life, both in public and in private. And while this perhaps is the simplest to speak to, it's also perhaps one of the most difficult because we love to gossip. Gossip is the great Achilles heel of so many of us. And so much of our karma is created through speech. So St. Teresa of Avila had a uh, determination, she's a Christian saint, where she would never say something about another person that she wouldn't say when they were there. Uh, Long Porpasano has a similar ethic. Um, he's renowned for this, just he will not say inappropriate things about people. My grandma was the same, actually. Uh, we asked her about Hitler once, and she said, I think he was misguided. And we never got her to say a mean thing about anyone. Um, 
And can we really build a community where that is the standard? We do not talk about each other behind our, each other's backs. And uh, you know, there's going to be times where you do need to address something, where you do need to sort of maybe say something that you wouldn't say with the other person there because it's necessary and skillful. Um, and there are moments like that. Uh, but can you constrain those moments and say, look, I don't usually talk about people behind their backs, or I usually wouldn't say this, but I, I think I need to just let you know something. And then say what you need to say, and then stop. There's a, another beautiful sutta where the Buddha says, a true person, uh, when asked about another's faults, speaks little, oh, does not say anything. If asked more, if pressed with questions, he says just a little, holding back. A true person, if asked about another's uh, bright qualities, speaks uh, at length without holding back. A true person, when asked about their own good qualities, uh, speaks little. If pressed with questions, they speak only as much as is necessary, holding back. If asked about their own negative qualities, they uh, speak much, basically. And I, I remember there's a Greek philosopher who said that um, if someone reports to you what another person said about you, they should s you should respond by saying, uh, only that much. If they knew all of my faults, they'd have a lot more to say. <laughs> it's a good one. So can we cultivate this ethic of humility and of caring for each other in, in, each in our speech to each other? beautiful speech and honestly sometimes even praising other people behind to another person behind their back is uh, it, it brings up the comparing mind in the person you're talking to so just note this so often with these really refined realms of speech it's not right or wrong it's often beautiful or unbeautiful so just know how much a community matters uh, how powerful it is for a community to make that determination together and with people who aren't in the community, too, you may uh, experience a bit of discord as you try to pull back from, from that gossip, but it's okay. You can tell the person, the old friend, the, you know, someone you used to relate to that way, just, look, I'm really trying not to gossip now. I'd appreciate if you if you could help me do that, support me in that. You don't have to say it's them making you gossip, but they'll kind of put the dots together, hopefully, and try to support you. The next is uh, one maintains uh, loving kindness in thought towards one's companions in the spiritual life. So as we come together, um, there's going to be plenty of people in this community who annoy you. And good, because this is your family in, in, a, in a very real sense or in a dharmic sense. And the chance to really understand that this is... Uh, these are who we practice with. This is how we develop patience and care and a broader scope of kindness in the heart. Um, so when these difficulties come up, when you conflict with another person in this community, can you remember you're both walking the same path? And can you recollect that without those people who really make you develop these qualities of patience, of care, you'd have no chance? So what a gift. What a gift. And uh, many of you know the story of Gurdjieff, who uh, was a Sufi teacher, and there was a community member who was always being troublesome. And one day Gurdjieff was gone, and the other community members chased him away. And when Gurdjieff returned, he said, "Where did you, where did you, like chase him away to? I pay him to be here." So, really looking at these people as your teachers in that. and thinking of them that way and not dwelling in ill will towards them if you can put it down. The fourth quality is whatever one has received in a righteous way, one does not partake of it without first having shared with one's companions. And this gets to the heart. Uh, there's so much here because Many of you will know in Buddhism, the root cause of suffering, of dukkha, of stress is craving. And the quintessential switch 
for much of the path is one from craving and feeding off of the world, feeding off of the people around us. Upadana, uh, craving or clinging, can be the image is often fire clinging or feeding off of a log. It's a switch from that to an ethic of blessing, of giving to the world. Often we call this chanda. It's a different sort of desire, zeal, giving. And this ethic of switching from consuming, feeding off of the world to giving to the world, it's foundational to the path. And there's almost in every moment there's a chance to make that switch. So with giving, the Buddha said, if beings knew as I knew the fruits and results of giving, they would never eat without first having given, not even if it was their final mouthful, but because beings, if there was someone to share it with, but because beings do not know as I know the fruits and results of givings, they eat without first having given, Stinginess stains their mind. What would it mean to take that to heart? And often we don't understand how many opportunities there are to give in a day. So many of the little things in our lives that are rote, that are habitual, these people we take for granted, these interactions were sort of numb to. These are exactly where the path is hidden. This is where we can apply intention because intention is comma, intention is the path. So it's all the little things often. Instead of uh, just taking someone's laundry out of the dryer, can you fold it? Um, instead of simply, uh, you know, can you write a little poem for your loved one? Can you bring them a cup of tea? Um, can you make time to listen or go for a walk with them? And in some places, this is really taken to this beautiful level. In Sri Lanka, they have a practice called Saraniya, which is where you don't eat until you've given. And uh, I know people who have taken this on. Uh, my parents did for a while. And always, uh, you know, for that period, they would give soup to people on the street. They'd bring, you know, you can bring cookies to neighbors, whatever it takes, but find someone to give to. The Buddha said, even the leftover rice in your bowl, practitioners, if you dump it into a bush, but think, may this be for the little beings here. This is an act of giving. This is merit. So can we give with that level of, uh, of intention constantly? And to see what a wholesome act it is to, uh, to find places where we can really make this a practice. Um, often, you'll find this tension comes up with the giving. Um, you know, say, bringing something on an airplane as a gift. Uh, I'll often find a place where I'm like, I really don't want to take a bigger carry-on than that. And, you know, maybe I'll just take one less book to give away as a gift. And when you hit that limit, Make yourself take the book because it's exactly the limit you should push yourself over. It's not, it's Donna if it hurts a little bit. So it's good to push yourself a little bit. And the Buddha said the potency of merit from giving is dependent on, on a few factors. Uh, first of all, there's the, uh, well, one of the factors is the way you give. So the Buddha said one should give uh, respectfully. One should give with one's hand, with one's own hand. One should give carefully. One should give uh, with a view that something will come of it. There's one other, but I'm forgetting. But those are pretty good. So if, you know, if it comes down to ordering a gift for a friend on Amazon, can you have it delivered to your own house and then go give it to them in person? Uh, give it wrapped in something, bring a card with it. Really understand the power of this act you're stepping into of giving is sacred. And the when we speak about merit, the potency of the merit, it's just, it's the goodness in the heart which comes up. And you'll feel it when you give with your hand, it has a power to it. Um, the other thing the Buddha said determines the potency of the merit of the goodness is 
the reason for giving, and he gave seven levels of reason. Uh, one is with the view, uh, and this is sort of the most basic, having given, may this come back to me, may I receive what I have given. The next is giving uh, because it is good. Uh, the next is giving with the thought, this person is less than me, why don't I give to them? And it moves on up through these levels to the final two are one gives thinking, when I give, it settles the mind in serenity and it calms easily. And the seventh is one gives as an ornament of the mind. So you can see this most basic level of giving with the view something would return of it. Obviously it's somewhat basic. And yet there are times where it's really useful when you are having trouble just getting, make yourself, making yourself give what's hard to give. Remember, in a Buddhist conception, it's not lost. It's never lost. Uh, the Buddha says that when a house is on fire, the vessel salvaged will be the one of use. So when, when this life is on fire with birth, aging, and death, that which is given is well salvaged. The only thing we keep is the only thing that time doesn't take from us is what we give. And from a Buddhist conception, it will come back in various forms of brightness, of love, and you'll find very often the happiest an item will ever make you is when you give it away. This is a great Buddhist insight and obviously an insight of every spiritual tra tradition. But you'll find over time of practicing that when you get something new, the first thing that pops into your head is who can I give this to? And this often leads in monasteries to these like chains of re-gifting. I've had something re-gifted to me after it like hit like a few different monks and then it comes back because it's so much fun to give stuff away, and we also don't need that many things. But uh, can that be the first object in your mind? And, you know, when you want, especially if you want something, can you simply, instead of trying to negate the valence of that desire, can you reverse the polarity and make yourself give it away? Because uh, that is easier, actually. And, and like I said before, you can still click buy on Amazon, but just change the delivery address. And... So this uh, giving at that level, sometimes that is what you need to make yourself give, is thinking, this isn't lost. But then the act of giving is so sacred, often it will overwhelm any of that taint of selfishness. And then the upper echelons of that, those intentions have to do with giving because uh, as a path and a means towards calming and brightening the mind for nibbana, for awakening, that's the ultimate goal. And... The other factor which the Buddha said uh, determined the potency of this kama is the recipient. Um, namely, if someone who is giving is moral and if someone who's receiving is moral. But when people ask the Buddha, where should I give? He said, that's a different question. You should give where you feel inspired. And that's so interesting that the Buddha made this distinction between this arithmetic of like, how meritorious is this person? How meritorious is, is how meritorious am I, uh, or how moral am I? And instead, say, look, give where you're inspired. It's a sacred act. It's one of the few and first acts of true free will you have as a young child is when you give for the first time. And in Thailand, you'll see like parents directing their kids to put little bits of rice in the bowl. It's beautiful. So, can we have a community where? That's the ethic, is just this giving constantly. And the sixth uh, factor of the uh, harmony and conditions to harmony is shared right view. That is onward, noble, leading to the end of stress. And perhaps what can just be noted here is that the fact that we're all walking this path together, that we all have this aspiration for a true spiritual transcendence, allows a cohesiveness to this community that would be lacking otherwise. It's why so many communes in the 70s tore themselves apart, is they didn't have this shared structure of a purpose. And so people create their own suffering and drama. But here we've stepped into a place and a community where the Binding ethic is not how well you get along with someone. You are not here for each other's personalities. You are not here for each other's personalities. And 
if someone comes into a group that you don't like as much or they're a bit awkward or a bit too talkative or they annoy you, it doesn't matter in this community because we're here for something far greater and there's a safety in that ethic of welcome. And you really begin to feel that resonance as practitioners over the years is you'll meet people who you haven't seen in a long time and it'll feel like you've, you haven't even been away from each other because you've been walking the same path. So, as we try to create this uh, communal fabric from, from nothing, from a gym and a, a teaching and kind of a MacGyvered together AV system, um, we are trying to recreate something that is truly sacred. The Buddha said, uh, and many of you will know this quote, Kalyanamitta is the whole of the spiritual life. And to support one another in that, uh, and to cultivate this ethic of radical giving in this community. And one way, um, you know, this is relevant because uh, we've just, um, I really would love it if people, uh, if we had this community begin to really, can you make it a practice of once a month opening your house and cooking for people? and just welcoming them, welcoming them in, or maybe twice a month. Um, and one issue is how do you connect with, with, with people? And so we actually just have a new web page on the website called Mitta Meetups. Uh, Mitta means friend, so it's like friendly meetups. And basically it's a little shared calendar you can go on and you can post uh, if you're willing to open your home for a night and host uh, what we call a Dhamma dinner. We also have the option of coasting a bhavana brunch. Um, we have Bodhi backpacks. So if you want to go on a hike with someone, um, chat GPT was very helpful in us coming up with names. <laughs> uh, we put aside Bodhi bash and Panya pilgrimage, but they were in the, they were in the running. Um, and then Donna dish outs. So can you get together with some people, make some sandwiches and coffee, and go hand them out to people in pairs in downtown Seattle and talk about it? Um, and, and really, like, wouldn't it be beautiful if we had an ethic where one day a week uh, or a month you cooked for a bunch of people that you invited over and then three of the other days you went and ate at another person's house and meditated and talked Dhamma. What a beautiful ethic that would be. And since we don't have a monastery yet, that's kind of what we're left with other than the Saturdays. So... I think it could be uh, really lovely and I just encourage people to sort of think about it and uh, think if, yeah, once a month, is there room for opening, opening something to uh, a greater ethic of hospitality and giving and weaving our lives back together in that way? So, uh, and you can even serve beans. Yeah. Sadhu. So